Great. Welcome back. So first off, welcome to Nadia, who's joining us for the first time in lecture today. Yay. Hi, y'all. <laughs> welcome, Nadia. I don't know if you all know you. that Nadia has been secretly taking this class, or not so secretly, but now she's with us. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I couldn't wait to come. Like I was uh, seeing the recordings of and seeing everyone in the recordings. <laughs> and yeah, I could join finally. It was in computer time zone, but um, during the Ramadan, I'm trying to stay up late and we'll try to join the lit, uh, last few classes we have. Welcome to our YouTube channel. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so the... Um, well, before we begin, one thing, I got a couple of questions for two things. One is, I have met with many or most of you about your research projects, but not with all of you. So if you haven't met with me about your research project, then it's probably a good idea that you do that sooner rather than later. So I can sort of, you know, um, be at ease knowing that everything is going well and you're working on your research projects and it'll be amazing write-ups for me to read in a couple of weeks. If you haven't done that already, uh, please do that. Second thing, um, I got a couple of questions um, about how to conduct literature reviews. Um, and um, I dug up a possibly useful piece of reading. So if you go to the same Google Drive folder where I posted all of these reading materials, uh, in the lit review folder, there's a chapter from the Zobel book that um, uh, teaches writing for computer science. It's a, a book that we use in another class that I teach. Um, and there's a chapter in there which I posted uh, about how to conduct literature reviews. So yeah, um, take a look at that, see if that's in, of any use. If I find more useful materials in the meantime, I'll, I'll let you know and I'll post this as well. Um, third, um, I haven't gotten many requests about topics to add or remove to the last remaining lecture. So unless you tell me something um, about this, we will continue as planned. So uh, speaking of planned, the plan for today was to talk a little bit about mixed methods research. We've seen lots of examples of both qualitative and quantitative research methods in the semester so far. Um, and um, we've even seen lots of examples, I think, among the readings, um, the example papers of uh, studies that combine methods. So um, I wanted to uh, just dive a little bit deeper into what, what it means to combine methods and so how to think about that um, and how to combine methods in a meaningful way and so how to report and, and discuss uh, findings that come from mixed methods study. So that's hopefully the plan for today. Um, any thoughts or questions or things about anything so far? All right. Um, we'll also have a few examples. Uh, Nadia has kindly volunteered to present one of these mixed methods papers um, for today. Uh, and I have a couple more that we could we could touch on uh, to illustrate some of the things that we're going to talk about. So there'll be some examples later, uh, and a few sort of uh, higher level methodological points about mixing methods in the beginning. Um, all right, so I you know I've made this point many times over in the class so far. It's sort of the point I started the semester with, and I'm bringing it back because it's, I, I think it's sort of the, the core the core message of this entire class, or you know empirical research in general. Um, all methods have limitations. Hopefully you are convinced of that by now after seeing the nitty gritty details of many different methods and seeing all of these examples of studies applying the different methods. Um, I, I hope that's, that's clear. Um, but um, the, I guess the silver lining if, is that um, oftentimes you can compensate the weaknesses of some methods with the strengths of another. So this is where this entire idea of mixed methods research designs uh, came from, sort of from an attempt, very pragmatic attempt to overcome some weaknesses or limitations of some methods by um, combining methods together in the same study. So uh, stepping back for a second, do you remember this discussion at the very beginning, probably of the semester of the uh, 
epistemology of, of research, the different philosophical worldviews. There were four that we talked about back then. Does anybody remember what the four were? Uh, I just remember that um, activism, sort of, and pragmatism were two of them. I forget uh -huh. that. I forget the first two. Yeah, thanks, Anna. I think there was one about truth being um, objective. Um, I can't remember what that was called. Was it just objectivism? Pragmatism? Um, positivism, maybe? Positivism. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there constructivism? There we go. So that's number four. I, I don't know where my hand is. Number four. Because um, this, this is mirrored. The camera view is mirrored on my screen. It's weird. Um, anyway. So yes, so uh, positivism or post-positivism, this is the one that's most typically associated with quantitative research, kind of you know, top-down uh, hypothesis testing style research. Um, constructivism, often associated with qualitative research. Okay, so these are so two sort of very common, very popular ones. And then the sort of activist participatory worldview and the pragmatist worldview. Okay. So um, the way I think about mixed methods research is as belonging to this pragmatist worldview or sort of um, illustrating exactly that, right? Because it, it kind of embodies this idea that, you know, there's no perfect method. We shouldn't be purists about the methods. We should focus on the problems that we're working on, the research questions that we're interested in, um, and just apply whatever methods are available and, and appropriate um, for those research questions and problems to do the best we can, right? Without so being method purists. Uh, so I, I associate mixed methods research a lot with the pragmatist worldview. Uh, okay, one thing first, or not first, next, one thing next. Um, th there's a lot of confusion around this term mixed methods. I thought it'd be useful to just clarify sort of what people mean by mixed methods. Uh, before we go on uh, with, with more stuff. So um, you will find, I think, that in theory, in the textbook, uh, which by the way, the textbook, the chapter on mixed methods from the uh, textbook is also in the same folder. So you can still go read that in, in more detail. Uh, in the textbook, in theory, when you say mixed methods, you're referring exclusively to the combination of qualitative and quantitative. Okay, um, and you you know you could ask uh, like why does why does it have to be one and the other like can't you just uh, for example combine two different quantitative things or combine two different qualitative things or you know whatever like wh why must you combine just one qualitative and one quantitative um, and uh, you you mustn't at least as far as I'm concerned but the technical term that uh, I don't know the book uh, the in theory, um, literature refers to when you're talking about combining something other than a quantitative and a qualitative research component, it's called multi-methodology as opposed to mixed methods. Um, in practice, you will see that everybody calls these mixed methods, no matter what they're doing. But if you wanna be purists about sort of terminology, uh, when when people say mixed methods, you should probably expect a mixture of qualitative and quantitative. So, you know, using two different quantitative techniques, for example, in the same study would not count as a mixed method study, even though you're using two different methods, technically. Okay, so uh, just, just keep that in mind. So um, now where do you use them? You could use them anywhere. You use them to collect data, um, use them to analyze the data you collected. You could use them anywhere. Okay, um, and so why do you use them? You use them to complement, to corroborate, to expand findings, um, or to combine and integrate inductive research with deductive research. Um, so th that's sort of you know, why, why you would do this in the first place. You do this because it does something more than any one of the two would have done by itself. Okay, um, okay so there's, three familiar strategies for 
designing for combining methods in a mixed method study. Uh, I will refer to just mixed methods, mixed methods as this combination of qualitative and quantitative, but I don't think any of this is so strictly um, restricted to that combination. You could sort of think of this more broadly, but I'm, the examples I have here are uh, so assuming this qualitative quantitative combination, okay? Uh, just for illustration purposes. Uh, all right, so if, if you don't remember anything from today's lecture, but the one thing, right? So remember these three ways in which you could sort of design mixed methods studies, okay? Okay, so what are they? So one, uh, number one, is the sequential explanatory strategy, okay? Um, so sequential means in order, okay, one after the other, and explanatory is self-explanatory. So that means uh, typically uh, you start with a quantitative method, some quantitative analysis, um, and you collect and analyze that quantitative data, okay? Important, collect and analyze the quantitative data before you move on to the second method. Uh, and the second method in this strategy is typically the qualitative method, uh, and that's where you collect and analyze more data, right, using this qualitative method. So, you know, for example, you do some statistical analysis of some uh, data that you've collected from, I don't know, online traces or repositories or whatever. Uh, and we'll see an example of this, a concrete example of this later. Um, and you do some statistical analysis of that data and you, you have some findings, make some observations, uh, and then you follow that up with a qualitative component, for example, interviews with, I don't know, some relevant stakeholders to uh, help explain and interpret the things you found in your uh, quantitative statistical data analysis. Okay, it's like, why does this sound like a good idea? Or does it? I'm skeptical because how do you know what data to collect? You sort of have to make sure that your qualitative can be informative based on the data that you collect without actually doing the qualitative research. Um, expand on that a bit, if you will. I'm not sure I follow. So if you start with data collection of quantitative data, you have to get it right. You have to be collecting the right data to start. And you might not know which way mm -hmm. your qualitative data actually points or your qualitative results actually point. Mm -hmm. So you have to very carefully plan from start to finish, I think. Right, so you're saying, cool, um, that makes sense. You're saying, um, how, how do I know I'm measuring the right things, for example? Um, Especially, yes. So I think that's a good point you're bringing up because I think what you're saying is, um, by just combining two methods, in this case, a quantitative and a qualitative method in the same study, um, e each of the individual, the, the execution of each of the individual methods is by itself not any stronger, uh, any less limited than it would have been if you hadn't combined these. So uh, I guess the, you know, the, the threat to validity, the limitation you're raising is one that applies in general to any quantitative analysis of data by itself. I, I'm imagining something like you have a hypothesis that some feature is really influential in how developer, call it feature A is really influential in how developers work. And then when you interview developers in the end to sort of explain its effect, it turns out none of them even care about feature A, they care about feature B instead. And you probably should have been collecting data on that instead. Yeah, cool. So that is, um, that is a good reason why this is a good idea as far as designing your study goes, right? Because um, the alternative is that you do this uh, quantitative analysis about whatever feature you're testing, um, and 
you draw conclusions and implications uh, and suggest changes and, and, and so on based on that alone. And you publish this paper uh, and it's completely irrelevant uh, because uh, you know, people immediately realize that none of that can happen in practice or it's the wrong thing to do or whatever, right? So it's sort of really embarrassing if that ever happens, right? It's just bad. Or the reviewers will point that out. You probably won't get it published, right? Let's say, let's say peer review works. You get the reviewers to point out all of these things during the peer review process, okay? So in other words, what you're saying is, you know, if only you would have combined the, your initial quantitative analysis with some qualitative analysis, uh, for example, in this case that follows it, um, that would have revealed that you had measured and tested the wrong thing. Right at you know, and at which point you are happy, right? Because you sort of uh, spare yourself the embarrassment of going through peer review with something that doesn't make any sense, for example, or worse, getting it published. Um, and you go back to the drawing board and start over, and you measure the right thing, right? But you sort of do this before it's too late. This just seems inefficient to me. I would rather not have to start over, right? By asking the questions first. Um, okay, okay, but I mean, so th the other thing you're saying, so let, let me rephrase this last comment you're saying. Um, essentially, you're saying that this particular strategy, the sequential explanatory strategy that we're talking about right now, is, surprise, not universally applicable or beneficial to all uh, research scenarios or research questions. Um, and, you know, I would refer you back to the slide I opened with, today's lecture and or the, some of the slides in the first ever lecture about how all methods are limited. Uh, turns out mixed methods are also methods. So mixed methods are also limited. So, you know, there's no silver uh, bullet in, in that sense completely, right? There's no free lunch, right? Especially these days, there's really literally no free lunch because we're all working from home and we have to buy our own lunch. At least when we were on campus, there used to occasionally be free lunch, uh, but th really there's no free lunch on campus or when it comes to research methods. Um, there are, however, scenarios where this ordering of methods and steps, stages, phases in your research makes sense and is valuable. Um, for example, when um, you know, there's less uncertainty about the things you're measuring uh, or they're very sort of straightforward things to measure. They don't, they're not, um, I, I don't know, um, uncertain in that way, like are you measuring the right thing? Uh, and you just are looking for some explanations for why you might be observing those patterns in, in the data as, as observed, right? So maybe the measurements and observations are straightforward, but you don't know why you might be observing the things you are observing. Uh, and you sort of want to follow that up and figure that out. Um, long time ago in the class, I talked, I gave this example um, of um, a, a researcher at Microsoft Research that was studying code review practices inside Microsoft. And um, in that study, they had started by measuring the um, um, code review speed. Uh, they had all of this log data um, and they measured how long it took before, I don't know, the, the change request was submitted and the change request was reviewed and approved. Uh, right, they had measured that time that the change was in review. Uh, and one of the uh, interesting unexplained observations from that very simple analysis was that there were quite some of these changes that had been reviewed in a matter of seconds or minutes, which, which seemed very odd uh, because just sort of the amount of time it would require somebody to read those things would, uh, would be longer than that. So there, right, the measurement was straightforward. It just measured this, you know, the, the straightforward metric. But what was unknown is why, why those things were there. Like, let's assume the measurement was correct. What was unknown is of why that thing was happening, right? So that's where in that example I talked about, I don't know, many lectures ago, um, some interviews with those developers, those engineers, illuminated, clarified why that was happening. It was happening because they were doing these reviews offline in person before submitting those change requests. 
Uh, and by the time they were submitting those change requests into the review system, they had already reviewed and decided on the outcome of those reviews. So they could literally just be approved in a matter of seconds. They had done all of this work offline. It was not recorded in the data, okay? So that's sort of one example where um, the sequencing makes sense, arguably. Okay. Um, the opposite, so we're still talking about sequencing, but in the opposite direction, the opposite is called sequential exploratory. Um, so this is where you start with a qualitative analysis, data collection and analysis, and you follow that up with an analysis of quantitative data. Could you think of an example where this would make sense? Uh, or for example, a paper that we read uh, or something like this that, that used a strategy similar to this one. I will present one paper related to this today. So there, the thing was that uh, they were unsure of the theory. Uh, it was uh, uh, based on grounded theory. So they didn't know the explanations of things or uh, they didn't have the in-depth ideas of what is going on. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, then they first analyzed it with qualitative study, with interviews. And then they, when uh, they developed some theory, then they went for the surveys and the quantitative methods. Mm -hmm. So they could back up or triangulated the study with the surveys. Yep, thanks. Uh, can anybody think of an example that we already discussed in a previous lecture? that did something similar to this. Uh, your paper did this with the, um, what was it? Uh, there was at first a series of interviews and then there was a linear regression model uh, correlating gender diversity and tenure diversity with mm -hmm. uh, productivity. Right, so, um, right, that was, that was an example. Um, a, a good example of, of this strategy because it so started, it had these two phases, they were done in sequence. The first phase was just a theory building phase wh where we sort of figure out what it is, we're uh, looking to test if anything. The paper, a paper, any study could have arguably ended there, right? You could have ended with this theory building phase where you uh, elicit some hypotheses or something, right? Uh, from the ground up, you do a qualitative study, uh, you interview some, some people, for example, we'll see this in Nadia's paper um, in, in a few minutes. Um, so you, you derive these hypotheses, you make these observations, typically from a small sample, right? You know, if you're lucky, you interview, I don't know, 20 people or something like this, right? So you, you make some observations from a relatively small sample um, through some qualitative analysis, and then you could have ended the paper there, the study there, or you could say, um, you know, can I uh, find any more evidence to either validate or, or, or uh, invalidate, confirm, augment some of these things that I've observed on this small um, sample that I did a qualitative analysis on. And you follow that up with something at a larger scale that's typically quantitative because it's hard to do qualitative things at, at a large scale. Does that make sense? So it's sort of for additional validation um, or, um, so th that was the second example you see there on the slide. So testing the elements of some emerging theory. The first phase is the emergence of this theory. The second phase is testing elements from it, right? Each of these two things could have arguably been a study by itself and could have argu arguably been a paper by itself. But here you're combining them in, in the same study in the same paper to make this you know, richer, deeper, more interesting. Okay. Um, or um, you, know, you, could, you could think of examples where um, you're using some quantitative data to um, help explain or interpret some, some qualitative findings that uh, might surface from say interviews or something like that. Um, Okay, so these were two. Number three and last is the concurrent triangulation strategy. So this is maybe the one that Jeremy is going to like the most because he hated the previous two that were uh, in sequence. He's probably going to like this one better because they're done concurrently. Okay, so here you're using these different methods 
at the same time, uh, while trying to confirm or cross-validate or corroborate findings. Um, and this is typically uh, because uh, what people say, think that you might uh, discover through a qualitative method like interviews could be very different from what people actually do, which you might be able to discover if you have access to, I don't know, log or trace data or something like that about their activities. Um, and if you're able to collect data simultaneously uh, and sort of you know, inform each data collection step by the other one, the, the corresponding qualitative or quantitative one, uh, this will probably help increase the validity of your data and therefore of your conclusions. That makes sense? So here, I guess what Jeremy was complaining about earlier is that, you know, you're wasting all this time. Like, what if you do this qualitative, sorry, like, I guess we, we started with quantitative. What if you do this quantitative thing first, and then you do some interviews and you discover that you've been measuring the wrong thing all along? Uh, and I said, well, that's great because you haven't yet published it, so it's not embarrassing. Um, uh, and Jeremy said, you know, but but you've wasted all this time. What if you had started with a better set of measurements from the beginning? So this this is sort of an example where you could get that, right? If you sort of you know validate some of these measurements as you're making them, for example, um, it gives you a better chance of um, measuring the right thing, so that you don't have to go back and uh, waste all of this research effort. Okay. So this is one, one idea there. Uh, so this diagram illustrates the process there. You sort of collect these sets of data in parallel concurrently, roughly. Um, and then um, you compare and integrate uh, findings. Um, you, an you analyze these two sets of data that you've uh, collected concurrently in, in parallel. You've analyzed, you analyze them jointly. You sort of use one to help interpret the other and vice versa. So you're doing this jointly all at the same time. This is very cool. So um, I'll have an example of this later on. Um, okay, so any any thoughts on any of this? So three, I asked you if you, you know, remember just, just one thing from today's lecture, remember three things. I'm cheating a little bit. Uh, but remember that, you know, there's a, these three fundamental core ways in which people design mixed method studies. Um, and, you know, they're not perfect, but they're useful in, in certain scenarios where you either do qualitative, quantitative in sequence, so that gives you two, or you do everything so concurrently, like that's the third one. That's called a concurrent triangulation strategy. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to tell you a little bit about next is so some of the standards of rigor for doing mixed methods research. So I've pulled, there's an, this effort, ongoing effort right now. This is a fresh off the press. It is literally just happening. Um, so SIGSoft is the, uh, so SIG is the ACM special interest group on software engineering. Uh, all of the uh, communities that work with ACM, oops, sorry, um, have uh, a, a, a SIG, uh, SIGSoft is the software engineering SIG. Uh, within this special interest group, there's now an effort to develop uh, standards for evaluating empirical research, in this case in software engineering, but uh, you'll see that uh, these are more, uh, more general than, than that. Um, um, so that uh, reviewers, for example, uh, of mixed methods papers, of any empirical research papers, but I will only focus on the mixed methods uh, studies here, um, so that reviewers of these papers uh, know what to look for when they see mixed methods research, uh, and so know how to evaluate it, um, and uh, you know, know what things to rightfully complain about and what things not to complain about. Um, so, and this came out of an observation, uh, anecdotal, that uh, oftentimes people were getting uh, not great reviews to empirical mixed methods research papers that were sort of, you know, uh, complaining about the wrong things or, or not valuing enough some of the right things and, and things like this. So it's an effort to educate the community and to sort of standardize a little bit the, 
the standard for rigor when doing mixed methods in empirical research. Um, if you're curious about these, they, they have um, similar standards for all the different empirical research methods. I'm not going to talk about that now. I'm just going to focus on the standard, the draft of a standard. This is ongoing um, for uh, mixed methods studies. Um, and this is, by the way, this is being authored uh, as we speak by uh, Peggy Story from University of Victoria, if you're curious who's, who's working on this. Um, all right, so the standard talks about um, things that are essential to have in any mixed method study, but right? the must haves, things that are desirable to have, uh, and things that are you know, nice but maybe optional. It also talks about some anti patterns, the things that um, uh, reviewers have noticed authors doing when it comes to mixed method studies for no good reason. So it's sort of an, an attempt to illustrate these anti patterns and educate people about so how to avoid them. So I just want to walk you through some of these. I, I thought many of them are interesting. I just want to walk you through some of them. You could read all the details on the, um, the draft of uh, the standard, which is in this GitHub repo and is being developed uh, as we speak. Okay, so um, some things that a research paper com uh, combining methods in a mixed method or multi-methodology, I'm gonna use the two terms interchangeably. I'm just gonna call everything mixed methods for simplicity. Um, things that sh should be there. Uh, one, you should, um, motivate you the author should motivate why why you've used those different methods and okay. why did you have to combine the methods and it was not enough to uh, use one or the other for example okay. you have to in writing justify why you chose that design and okay. so this is a must have you have to have that um, next um, okay, so this is sort of the same um, uh, a purpose. Then, what what are you trying to accomplish by combining these these methods? Um, then you have to describe what they are. Okay, so you describe what the individual methods part of this mixed methods design uh, are. You um, have to describe which phase of the research study. The different methods were used in. Okay, so remember when we talked about the three examples earlier, right? In two of the three, there was this sequencing of the methods. The third one was done jointly. Each of these have um, you know, strengths and, and weaknesses, as we have discussed on that example with Jeremy. Um, so here you have to describe which phase of the research study you use these different methods in. And this ties into the previous thing about the purpose statement and the motivation for why you chose these methods uh, in the first place and why you chose to combine them in this way, right? Because you sort of, you have to articulate how, uh, you know, what are the limitations of say the quantitative method that you used first that you hope to uh, alleviate with the qualitative interviews that you do second or, or something like this, right? You have to articulate this in writing. Um, okay, yeah, cool. You have to describe, articulate how the design uh, aligns with the research questions you've uh, listed in your paper. Okay, so it's not enough to uh, just combine methods, but you sort of have to combine them for a reason and for a purpose. They have to um, serve your research goals somehow. You don't just combine them for the sake of combining them. Um, this turns out is an anti-pattern. I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, we have to describe how this aligns with the research questions or objectives. By the way, this, this bit by itself, this last one, is not even about mixed methods. Right? You have to do this period when you're doing anything. Okay? You have to uh, trace back or forward the methods that you've chosen to the research questions that you've asked and, and articulate the, how and why those methods are appropriate for the research questions that you're asked. Okay, you have to so trace these the back and forward between each other. Okay, so that it's clear why you've done this. Right? But 
this is one of the most common criticisms you will get on empirical research papers of any kind, mixed methods or otherwise, is that the methodological design choices that you've made are not motivated. Like people hate it when you do something, but you don't motivate why you've done it. Okay, they want to see that there's some um, sort of fundamental principle or reason why you've done the things you've, you've done. Okay, so this is one of the worst things you could do in any empirical research study is not motivate why you're doing what it is you're doing. So yeah, another thing to uh, remember if there's room in your buffer from today. Um, this one, super important again. Um, so this one says that when you're doing mixed methods, you should integrate the findings from all the methods together to address your research questions or goals. So it's not enough to do mix, it's not enough to do independent empirical studies and call that, put, put those in the same paper and call that a mixed method study, okay? That won't count as a mixed method study unless you actually integrate the findings um, from say the two methods. I say, if you've done, I don't know, if you've done uh, interviews and some uh, quantitative statistical analysis or a survey and some statistical analysis, uh, and you're not combining those, you're not integrating the findings, you won't actually count as a mixed method study. So it's just not good enough. It's, it's essential that you um, integrate these um, results from the different methods, because otherwise you could have just done those studies independently, right? So you, again, this comes back to like, why is it that you're combining these? Why is it that you're mixing these methods? How does mixing by itself, the fact that you're mixing them, how does that serve your research goal, right? And if you just treat them as independent studies that happen to be part of the same paper, that defeats the purpose, right? You could have just literally could have just published you know, smaller individual papers with each of those two components, right? If there's no integration between them, what's the point, right? You could have just published them separately. So there has to be some uh, integration. Um, um, and uh, finally, it's essential that you acknowledge the limitations associated, not just with the individual methods, which you uh, have to do anyway, but also with integrating the methods. Um, so for example, to, to illustrate this, um, let's say um, you, um, um, I don't know, let, let's say you do some quantitative analysis followed by interviews, one of the examples we discussed. Uh, but now the question is, who do you interview? Right, so you have to be very deliberate when you're sampling participants for your second phase interviews so that they are uh, drawn from the same population that you analyzed quantitatively, statistically in the first phase. That makes sense. If you're, if you're hoping to use the interview findings to explain some uh, strange observations in the data that you've analyzed, but you had better interview people that have contributed to that data that you've observe these strange things in, right? You can't just interview people from a completely different, I don't know, community or population or whatever, uh, and ask them about this specific observation that you've made on this other population. That won't make any sense, right? So here there's the limitations associated with just the, uh, the fact that you're combining these methods, right? In addition to all, in addition to, not instead of, in addition to all of the limitations of each of the method individually. Um, and so I won't go over all of those, um, but I've posted a couple of chapters from the textbook um, in the in a Google Drive folder with a much lengthier and, and good discussion of you know different kinds of limitations of, of these. So you know please take a look at that for uh, a lot more detail. Uh, okay, so these were the must-haves. Any any thoughts or opinions on on these? I'll go back for a second. I can go back without skipping. All right, so I'll take that as a no. So here are some other um, things that, uh, oops, talked about essentials. Uh, next up is desirable, things that are nice to have. Um, you define it, 
Okay, so you refer to it by one of these three uh, names um, that we talked about already of, of mixed method strategies or a different one still that we didn't talk about. There are other ones that we didn't talk about that are less common. Um, you um, describe and justify, motivate the um, how and, and why you've reused the sample between the two methods. I just talked about this example before, kind of you know, drawing interview participants from the same population, same sample you analyzed quantitatively. You draw a nice uh, diagram um, illustrating the research design and the combination of the research methods and how they contribute to answering, uh, how they map, they trace back to research questions and things like that. But it's not essential, it's not a must have, but it's a nice to have. It gives, makes the paper much more readable, becomes much easier to understand what you've done and why you've done it that way without reading just the text. I draw an overview figure uh, illustrating how these things uh, fit together. Um, oh yeah, cool. You even include this in your title. Uh, so, you know, you often see titles that say something, something, an empirical study of blah or blah. You know, you could say an em empirical mixed method study of, of blah and blah. Like why, why not be explicit? It makes it easier for people to find your paper afterwards if they're looking for uh, mixed method examples of um, this kind of research. Um, in your lit review, you um, include discussions of both the qualitative and quantitative strands of related work, if that's what you're combining. Um, and you articulate what the added value of this mixing is. Um, the, over just doing the things independently. So how does it help with corroboration or, or with expansion or in, uh, integration, triangulation, and so on? You, you are, this goes back to the previous point about motivating why you've, you've designed the study in that way. You, um, oh yeah, good. So um, I talked about how it's essential that you integrate findings and results between the two methods. It's also, uh, Nice. Uh, I would I would call this essential personally, but uh, in the standard, this is only listed as desirable, not essential. Um, you discuss discrepancies and incongruent findings, disagreements between findings from each of the two methods. Okay, so if your interviews say that um, uh, team diversity is beneficial. Uh, but your quantitative data analysis uh, finds that there's no evidence that uh, increased team diversity correlates with um, better outcomes. You know, you have to discuss why that is. You can't just leave it at that. You can't just end the paper saying, oh yeah, people said that, you know, this, but we find that and they don't match the end. Yeah, you can't, you can't just do that. Uh, they won't. Um, that won't make any sense. So you have to have to um, put some more effort into uh, sort of figuring out why these things are incongruent, right? Uh, and this ties back to the limitations of each of the individual methods. So can, for example, am I measuring this in the right way? I have this theoretical construct that I'm testing hypotheses about, but am I, am I measuring, is my measurement reliable? Is it valid? Am I even measuring what I think I'm measuring? Is my analysis valid and so on and so forth? Right, so lots of things like this. You sort of have to go back and reflect on why things don't uh, align, if, if that's the case. So personally, I would call this essential. I don't know why the standard refers to this as just a nice to have thing. Um, this is true of any empirical study. You articulate your philosophical stance and assumptions and, and, and theory. Uh, you make that explicit. People rarely do this. Uh, it's nice to have. Um, you can talk about some of the challenges you faced in, in, in your design and how those could be mitigated by, by the mixture of the methods. You um, articulate the underlying theory or theories or theoretical frameworks, if any. You make those explicit. You discuss ethics and so on. So all, all, all good things. 
So now a few examples of anti-patterns, right? things that you will encounter. I, I have seen examples of many of these anti-patterns myself when reading mixed methods papers or reviewing mixed methods papers. Uh, I imagine you will too if you're, if you're reading this. So things to avoid doing yourselves. Um, number one, the uninvited guest. So here, um, this is a paper where you know, all of a sudden as you're reading, you stumble across some new research method that was never introduced or motivated or described anywhere before. Uh, you, you just, uh, um, you read the paper and you know, on the eighth page out of 10, uh, the authors go like, oh, by the way, we also did some interviews. Okay, so like, where did that come from? Like, you know, why, why and how does it fit into the, the story? And you know, why, why did you do this? And how did you do it? And, and so on. Like all of the things that we just talked about in terms of motivating the design, right? Um, so like, hey, you know, we did this entire quantitative causal inference study uh, and you know, there's no mention of anything qualitative in the whole thing. And there's 20 pages of, of analysis and whatnot. And then in the discussion section, like, oh, by the way, we also interviewed 10 uh, participants or something, 10 developers, and we did this and that. Okay, so that just will not fly. Um, smoke and mirrors is another one. So this is where you're uh, overselling a study as a multi-methodology or mixed method study. Um, when uh, really there was no need to add this additional method when um, uh, basically you're just adding this additional method uh, as a token to uh, uh, make your study seem cooler, deeper, more complicated, more interesting, whatever. Um, but it doesn't really uh, contribute anything to the research uh, motivation or findings. You just do this because you think the reviewers will like this. You think the paper is going to be better received or because you've read mixed methods papers and you think, like, oh yeah, now I have to do mixed methods papers every time I do a study. So everything has to be mixed methods. So, you know, you just sort of invent some method to add to whatever your other method uh, was to begin with, uh, just, just as a token. Um, another one, uh, selling your soul. So, um, so here, you know, let's say, um, uh, I don't know, let's say you're um, primarily a quality, sorry, a quantitative researcher, uh, but you're submitting your paper to CHI and the CHI community, uh, I don't know, really likes qualitative research. Uh, so you're, um, you're adding this qualitative analysis component uh, that um, doesn't necessarily contribute substantially to the research findings because you haven't really designed your study to do that from the beginning, but just because you want to appeal to uh, that particular community or those reviewers. So uh, you want to please the reviewers or you to add this as a token, very similar to the previous one. Um, integration failure, where you don't sort of integrate and discuss these things jointly. They, they are just so sort of standalone independent parts of your study. Uh, that's an anti-pattern. Limitation shirker, uh, here you don't discuss the limitations from uh, the individual methods or from their integration. So there's so studies without discussions of limitations or threats to validity, that's an anti-pattern. Um, misalignment of um, the mixed method design with the research question or objective. Remember I talked about this in the essential uh, discussion, like you have to articulate, so you have to trace forward and backwards between research questions and um, methods and between findings and research questions. You sort of have to have this traceability be made explicit. Um, otherwise, you know, how, how can we judge as readers, as reviewers, if those methods have served their purpose? Like if we don't even know how they fit into, um, into the story and how they contribute to the design. Um, this is, a, again, so similar to the token usage, the cargo cult research, where you're, um, you don't really have expertise in qualitative research, but you're adding some interviews or a shallow survey or something to your otherwise quantitative paper, just because you think reviewers are going to look more favorably upon your paper if you do that. So you're just sort of adding it as a token. You, you, you don't really 
uh, know how to do that properly, but you know, you just hope it's going to work. You just do something. Um, design by committee. Okay, let's see what else. Um, golden hammer. This is where you're. Um, you insist on applying uh, some uh, method that you're most comfortable, most familiar with. Uh, could be quantitative, uh, for example, um, to to the wrong kind of data, to, to data that's not sort of suitable for that kind of analysis. Right, sample contamination. We talked about so the importance of being deliberate about. Uh, how and and why, and if at all, you're reusing your sample between the, the two uh, methods, the qualitative or, and or quantitative, from phase one to phase two, how and why you're reusing the sample. So there's sort of um, issues that uh, arise because of misuse of your sample between the two phases. Um, oh yeah, so this, this goes back to the Jeremy point from uh, earlier. Um, ignoring the writing of the wall. So let's say you uh, do this quantitative study uh, and you find something that upon interviewing uh, uh, practitioners, you discover makes no sense, but you're ignoring that writing on the wall um, and, sort of, um, and you're sort of continuing with your, um, I don't know, preformed conclusion, uh, if you will, predetermined uh, conclusion, if you will, ignoring the things emerging from this additional method that you've um, carried out. Um, okay, so this was in terms of anti patterns. And now, finally, a few things that people often complain about that they should not complain about. So I just wanted to list those as well. Um, people complain that the methods do not contribute equally to the study, that, you know, this, this, there's more qualitative stuff, then there's quantitative stuff or vice versa. Okay? There's no assumption that they be, uh, that they have equal weight. Uh, in, uh, for example, uh, you know, if you've analyzed thousands of uh, data from thousands of people uh, statistically, but then you only interview five, um, you know, it's not valid to complain that the samples are imbalanced, that you should have interviewed a thousand. That's not a valid criticism. Um, it's also not a valid criticism to say that um, a method is unnecessary if it adds some value, right? If, it, if, it, if it's beneficial in some way, it's not, it's not a valid criticism to say that it wasn't needed. Um, it's also not a valid criticism to say that um, they, because they have different philosophical foundations, you know, the constructivist worldview and the post-positivist worldview, for example, if you're combining qualitative and quantitative, uh, these things are so fundamentally incompatible and therefore you shouldn't be combining them in the first place. You know, that's not a valid criticism. Personally, I've never seen that uh, uh, criticism myself, but um, so it's, it's part of the standard. I imagine it came from somewhere. I imagine some people do complain about this. Um, this is similar to the uh, first one that, um, like, I don't know, like if you wanted to see that the weights are off, if, if you, the reviewer, wanted to see more quantitative stuff or more qualitative stuff, but the authors chose to design their study uh, in the opposite way, you know, that, that's their choice. They're, they're free to make that choice, but you should respect that. Uh, you should judge the paper on its soundness and credibility and so on, and not necessarily on the author's preference for sort of which method to give more weight to. That, uh, that's not a valid criticism. Um, it's also not a valid criticism to say that the methods have inconsistent findings, therefore the paper is invalid or, or something. You should reject it, right? So this is actually, uh, personally, I find these to be the most interesting ones, the ones where like one of the methods points to a uh, possibly different conclusion than the other. I find this to be very interesting because there's something to be learned from resolving these inconsistencies. Um, either something that has to do with the main uh, phenomenon we're studying or something that has to do with how we're studying it, the measurements and so on, the analysis, the design. But either way, it's very interesting, right? When you have something that like this that, that doesn't align because that's an opportunity to, to learn something uh, new, something more. 
Um, okay, so this was this was basically the discussion of uh, type strategies of mixed methods uh, research designs. There are three. Uh, hopefully, you will remember those. Uh, and some examples of things to sorry, some um, methodological examples of things to include and discuss and, and motivate in your papers as you're doing mixed methods. Um, I would like us to look at some example papers using mixed methods next. Um, hopefully Nadia can uh, share the one she was planning on, on presenting. Um, but before, before doing that, any thoughts or questions on any of these uh, meta points about uh, the design or uh, anti-patterns or things to have or not to have? Mm. I have a question or maybe just a comment, I'm not sure. Um, so with the research that I'm doing on cyber deception stuff, um, one of the reasons that I wanted to use the mixed methods is because uh, there's just not a lot of data available for that sort of thing. And there's not really a good way to get it. So the stuff I'm looking at doing is the human subjects experiment, but you can't get a whole lot of you know, data out of that. So also doing simulation, and a survey. So would that be a valid reason? It wasn't on your list of reasons to use mixed methods, but um, lack of data, is that a valid reason to be that? Yeah, th th thanks for that. Um, I, I think definitely yes. I think so the, um, the, the point I was trying to, bigger point I was trying to make is that um, you can all can and probably should, I, I really like mixed method studies myself. You can and probably should um, use a mixed methods design for your study if any of the individual methods you would have used otherwise are weaker by themselves. Right? So, you know, that's the example you gave, I think is spot on. Like you have an example uh, of a domain or a problem where, um, you know, it's there's very little data that's available of any kind. So, you know, to get a more complete picture of what's going on, you sort of have to, you have to, right? You have to combine, you know, all of these different ways of looking at the same phenomenon because, because each of the ways by itself is sort of quite limited. You only have a very narrow lens to, to look at the phenomenon you're, you care about. So, you know, you're hoping to get a richer picture understanding of what's going on by looking at it from different angles. That, that makes perfect sense. That's sort of a textbook example of why you would you would do this. So yeah, I'm I'm on board with that. Well, then I will pass this uh, to Nadia, who's gonna give us an example of what kind of strategy is it, Nadia? Uh, this is sequential exploratory. Sequential exploratory. Okay. Um, let's see. I guess you can share your screen. Yeah, I think I can. Can you see the paper? Yeah, I, it shows up on my end. Okay, uh, so yeah, I have deliberately not uh, being a slide because I wanted to show uh, this is a qualitative uh, research and I wanted to show some of the artifacts uh, they have presented in the paper that would not be possible in the slides. And also the structure of the paper is a good thing to look at. Um, so uh, let me uh, start saying what uh, the paper means to study. Uh, the thing they want to study is the testing practices. Uh, they want to know what the testing practices are uh, in the plugin systems. So why they have uh, deliberately um, uh, separated plugin systems from other kind of systems. So um, the justification they have provided is that, um, so they uh, in regular systems, um, there can be some testing stuff going on, but when you are developing a plugin, it has uh, interactions with a lot of other plugins, and it's uh, it has uh, it has been uh, implemented on some of the um, tools, maybe. And there's multiple plugins. You need to interact with those. You need to have the configurations and the versions. So there is a lot of combinations. So that is why there is a combinatorial explosion, uh, explosion here. So uh, they were guessing that uh, this uh, computer exploration and the plugin testing as a whole can have uh, some challenges that are not uh, in regular systems, uh, in uh, testing of the regular systems. So that is why they brought this up. And um, 
So they have uh, the study is uh, explorative, as I mentioned, and this is a, a sequential explorative study. So that means that they have started with some interviews, uh, two different interviews they started with, and then they triangulated the findings with a survey of uh, with 151 uh, professionals. So um, they have mentioned that uh, this is uh, uh, this is based on grounded theory, uh, which means they don't they don't have a theory from before. Uh, so they are uh, exploring and trying to understand from the interviews that uh, uh, trying from the uh, and the in, uh, findings of the interviews will um, make some theory later on. So that is why uh, how they have uh, started this. Um, so uh, I like this uh, small section there that they have brought up uh, in previously, which uh, mentions about why this target system is different. What are the capabilities of those? What are the challenges? So uh, from this, I can clearly understand the gap that is here. So uh, the gap was in the literature, uh, the gap is that the, that this kind of plugin systems hasn't been uh, studied in depth. And uh, there, there has a surveys that uh, are mentioned in the later sections in related to work, uh, but uh, they don't know, understand the whys of these challenges or don't have the in-depth understandings of what kind of challenges can arise. Uh, so that was a gap. And the hook was uh, that uh, uh, there is a large community for uh, plugin developments. For example, they have taken uh, Eclipse as a subject. So um, this community can be get, get benefited with uh, the recommendations that they have made after the findings they have got from the interviews and the surveys. Uh, so uh, now we have we are in the experimentation design section where uh, they have first uh, talked about the Eclipse uh, plugin architecture a bit, uh, how the community they have uh, talked about the community and the positive attitude towards testing and all. And afterwards they have uh, come across with some research questions that they have. So the first three research questions, they have uh, four research questions as a whole. So the first three research questions are based on the interview guidelines that uh, they have uh, decided on. Uh, and the third one has come up uh, after some of the interviews so that they got some feedbacks from the professionals and then they come up with the uh, fourth research question. So it seemed a good idea for me because they have been like um, um, incorporating the uh, uh, findings they were getting in, in parallel with the uh, work. So what we have uh, understood from the previous studies that it should be parallel process, not the sequential in like in building the theory. So uh, the first research question is uh, that they want to know um, which testing practices are prevalent here. Uh, and the second one, uh, they want to understand if there is some specific uh, test approaches for the architecture of the plugin system itself. And the, fourth, the third one, they want to understand the challenges, which is uh, they have been focusing on uh, at the first. And for the fourth one, uh, when they uh, find out that uh, the uh, professionals have been talking about how they compensate the limited testing, so um, they wanted to uh, then understand if uh, the other people who are working on that have some additional composition studies to support these uh, plugin testing challenges. So the research method that they have used here, so they have started with a survey of the existing approaches. Uh, they have uh, surveyed the, uh, like from the scientific literature and the developer forums, they have uh, studied over 200 resources uh, and tried to understand what uh, they have been talking about. But uh, this is one complaint that I have with this paper is that uh, like they didn't really uh, put a summary of these resources or the findings that they, they have got in this phase. So uh, then in the next phase, they have conducted a series of interviews, uh, 25 interviews uh, for like one and one to two hours. And as they already mentioned, they were using the grounded theory approach. Uh, so um, the, as we saw in the qualitative uh, uh, analysis uh, lectures that uh, we need to do some transcriptions and do some codings. And they were using a memoing uh, approach of codings they uh, organize the course into concepts and then categorize those. So um, they have uh, found uh, some, uh, they have, uh, 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 they have uh, built some uh, theories based on those. And when uh, they got uh, in the state of saturation, then they uh, adjusted the guidelines. Uh, so later on, uh, what uh, is another good thing that they have done, I think, is uh, that they have presented the findings in uh, Eclipse Developer Conference as they were working on Eclipse as a subject. Uh, and they uh, uh, they had an audience of 100 practitioners who saw their 40-minute uh, uh, talk and could understand and could verify and evaluate the approach uh, and the find findings that they have uh, got. So they have also um, added one uh, survey at last uh, with uh, 151 practitioners. Um, so yeah, the participant selection was uh, from the different conferences from blogging and Twitter. So they got 25 participants from 18 uh, companies. Uh, so they, uh, they were all, all uh, Eclipse plugin developers and there were some testers and there were some project managers also. 
So when they presented the findings, uh, this is a good thing that I, I would like to show you at the last that they have in the technical report, they have really showed uh, everything they uh, used to come out to the findings, like the codes they have developed, the how they analyze the participant uh, interviews and how they group those things and everything. Uh, so I think this is uh, this has a good transparency in this uh, paper. So later on, the sections they have uh, provided are based uh, basically the uh, research questions that they had. So they have four sections for four research questions. So I also wanted to, to uh, show this uh, structure of the paper is that the generally we see that when uh, we uh, do multiple studies, multiple ten, um, mixed methods studies. So we have separate sections for like uh, showing different results, uh, maybe from the interviews we have got something, then later on maybe uh, from the uh, mining deposit that you have got something. So here they have, uh, for each research question they have uh, combine these two approaches together so which really sounded good to me like they have the sections of different uh, things they were uh, concerned with and for every um, part they have also included the uh, uh, survey uh, survey answers with the part, uh, with the interview uh, results so uh, for each of the sections they have uh, challenged the um, things that they got from the interview, supported the things that they got from the interview. So for every section, they have some uh, participants discussions and then also the results they got from the um, survey. So which was a good thing to me. So there's like, there's four sections, uh, which I'm not focused because like this is, uh, we just are focusing on the research method. So um, yeah, they have also put some uh, good graphs, uh, diagrams uh, based on the survey results that they have been getting and supporting the uh, findings they have from the uh, interviews. So there are four sections, so I'll just go forward and skip this. And yeah, could you say one more time at a, at a higher level, um, what are the methods and how have they been combined and, okay. and why have they done it that way? Okay, so uh, the methods, uh, they have, um, uh, first of all, it's uh, the exploratory, uh, sequential exploratory uh, uh, analysis. So which means that they have uh, done some qualitative uh, studies first and then supported with triangulated the findings with some quantitative studies. So they started with um, uh, reading the literatures uh, from the scientific uh, literature and the developer forum. So these things so that they have uh, understanding of um, which, uh, which challenges they might focus on, what, what are the things they should have, what are the uh, problems or what are the concerns of uh, the uh, uh, testing environment. So, um, so they started with the literature review here and then they conducted the interviews to have uh, in-depth understanding of what's uh, actually going on here. And they, as I said, they uh, followed grounded theory uh, because like uh, they don't have a theory from before, they want to build up a theory uh, from the findings of the interviews. And when they have the findings of the interviews after the transcriptions and coding and everything then they have supported with uh, uh, so they have supported with with a survey so they also evaluated within the conference so, uh, which is uh, another thing yeah so uh, this is the overall method that they are and the wise um Mm -hmm. So, uh, so um, as uh, they started with qualitative study because they didn't have uh, much uh, understanding of the challenges, uh, so there is no pre pre previous literature on the in-depth analysis of why these things are going being challenge uh, challenging in the testing with in uh, plugin systems. So first, they want to understand what is really going on, so that's why they conducted the um, uh, interviews. But then, when they have come up with some theory and come up with some findings, then they use those findings uh, to uh, do the surveys, uh, uh, which is the quantitative study, because they had already uh, some things on mind. They had the first questions they could, they, that they could study. So they wanted to support the qualitative uh, study with the numbers that we get. So uh, within the qualitative study, they couldn't reach a lot of participants. They could only reach 25 participants because in interviews, it's uh, very difficult to uh, like uh, have a broader uh, uh, number of people. So that's why then um, as when they had the findings already, uh, they went on the survey method uh, while they could reach uh, more than 150 people so they could uh, strengthen the research, uh, research outcome mm -hmm. okay so okay so um, then they uh, showed the results so i'm not going into details there's just just some um, diagrams they have some uh, charts based on the um, 
uh, surveys they have conducted and they have the interview results also. So based on the, uh, those, they uh, combined these things and showed uh, their results on each of the sections. So after that, they had uh, one section for discussion where they uh, give uh, some uh, uh, recommendations on the testing insights that they have got from the interviews. So uh, so uh, which, which was the hook that I said that they have something to say, how we should do it, how, sh how should, shouldn't, so what are the good things to do, what are the bad things to do. And they have a limitation um, uh, a section also where they uh, say that what, what could be the potential problems. For example, they mentioned in credibility that in grounded theory, it can happen that the findings do not feed the data of the participants. So as already Jeremy was mentioning about this. So for this, um, uh, they, they have strengthened the credibility by uh, evaluating the findings by presentation in the conference and also the uh, reaching the 150 developers uh, in the surveys. So uh, that's how they mentioned that okay, the findings are fitting the data as, as those uh, people were also from the Eclipse conference, mm -hmm. and uh, they also um, uh, said that they uh, these things uh, they, they are not um, uh, expecting the findings to generalize in different systems, but they have some understanding of uh, in which cases it can be generalized, which case they cannot. So they have some um, arguments uh, in this part that it can be developed uh, uh, used beyond Eclipse for some, some cases, and for some other cases cannot be. And they also mentioned why they haven't used any repository mining in beyond the people section, because they mentioned that uh, the things they were getting from the interviews uh, in the repository mining, they won't get uh, this kind of activities noticed. Like uh, it, it will be very hard to uh, see these kind of activities that they have been finding in the interviews and the results. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, and then they have a small literature section. And the conclusion. So um, another thing I wanted to show uh, is that after the paper, this is the technical report. So we have uh, the technical report here and where they have again um, uh, said all the steps that they have been going on. There's a nice figure here. I think they could include this in the paper as mm -hmm. well. Uh, but yeah, so this figure is uh, like uh, very understanding uh, about the approach. So they started with the uh, uh, literature of the plugin based systems and then they developed the interview guidelines throughout the interview studies. They had some pilot interviews around one, they have some evolution going on, and then uh, round two interviews were also there. So the theory emerged from the like total phase where they uh, also uh, went to the surveys and the evolution of Equis conferences. So one complaint I only have about uh, this figure is that they say that they're comparing uh, research-based literature, but I didn't find uh, anything of such in uh, this paper and the technical report also. And they mentioned that uh, the, the existing literature doesn't have uh, the uh, in-depth analysis, is there, those are only survey, surveys. So I didn't find the comparison. So that's one complaint I have of the paper, but the other sections are quite uh, well published. And uh, another good thing is that the whole thing uh, was not like uh, the as we uh, in the uh, as we just learned that the, in the sequential um, exploratory things have to be sequential. But it's not like really uh, for for the quality qualitative study it was not very sequential actually. So it was very iterative, and they were like changing the interview guidelines, building the theories, changing the theories. Uh, uh, checking that if uh, saturations, everything was going together, uh, not uh, sequentially, parallelly, so which was a good thing uh, that uh, we learned from the qualitative study um, lectures. So another um, very good thing that I found that they, um, uh, they have showed all the results from the service, also how they came up with the codings, all the coding, uh, uh, the coding framework they have shared, all the participants' transcription uh, codes were shared here. So, um, so let me show you a bit. So, yeah, so here you can see that they have um, given all the codes that they have developed, how they have categorized those, what are the definitions for those, which is I think a good thing to if someone wants to replicate the study and uh, it has great transparency also. Mm -hmm. So all the uh, categories are here. And then they have uh, for from the participants also, from the interview transcripts, they have the coded codes that they have got from the statement. So they have also uh, like uh, included everything here. So for all the participants, for the all 25 participants here. Um, and uh, they have also combined uh, an index where they have mentioned that which of the codes were mentioned by which of the participants. They, they have grouped it uh, by the codes also. And in the survey, um, I find a good thing here that uh, they, they tried to bribe people 
with uh, ultra cool mini slow lacquer instead <laughs> of like monetary uh, supply so it was a good thing i think so they they had a chance to be in a cool uh, solar car which can be a good way to uh, make people answer this survey so they had uh, like long questions were like they had 23 questions as a total so which uh, had some some open ended questions and most of were were question that which they found uh, which they defined from the interview study they have conducted before mm-hmm. uh, so yeah and uh, yeah last they have also mentioned if you can uh, put your email address for getting this solar car <laughs> so yeah so the survey response they have all they have also like showed all the survey response from the survey monkey all the numbers you can see the crudely they were happening so it was also a good thing to maybe keep in one technical report so yeah maybe <laughs> that's what i wanted to show any discussions or questions thanks a lot this was great thank you um, what do you think simon says clap I have to say I've liked this paper a lot even before seeing this technical report uh, just reading the paper itself but now after seeing how much uh, effort they put into 68 pages of technical report yeah. <laughs> how much effort they put into you know uh, making sure this is reproducible and being very transparent about everything they've done amazing really really amazing um this was what 2011 um, exactly oh, 10, uh, 10 years ago uh, yeah it was a long time ago They, they really don't make them like they used to huh <laughs> they, these uh, empirical papers this was really really great i, I like this a lot uh, so um hopefully you got a flavor of um a sequential exploratory strategy right so interviews to develop some theory and then a survey to test hypothesis from the theory um i have um a couple more examples but i guess we're running short on time so you'll you can read those on your own uh, i have on my deck here pointers to uh two other examples one uh, of an equ- sequential explanatory study i guess very briefly i could show you what that is um okay right so we talked about the greiler paper on testing this is the um, the other one Uh, the sequential explanatory strategy so here they start with a statistical data analysis of data from stack overflow you're probably familiar with the stack overflow platform uh, and they follow that up with interviews so here's the, the idea was that th- this is another one of these papers that from a long time ago 2011 as well um, the idea uh, here is that The, the stack overflow if you remember had started in 2008 um authors here were probably doing the study around 2010 so it's probably you know um uh, by that time stack overflow had become popular uh, and they were asking this uh, pretty very open ended research question why is it that stack overflow is successful they had observed that lots of people are Uh, on stack overflow and that it's a popular platform they were asking why what's going on what makes this so special so what they did is they um, did some um statistical data analysis of some of the data about answers and posts on stack overflow see how quickly questions get answered and and things like this how many questions get answered how many go unanswered and so on um and they have all kinds of so sort of quantitative findings about that uh how many users there are how quickly questions get answered how many get answered uh, etc etc um and then right to get more depth into why why is it why is it that it's so successful right these metrics only paint a picture of maybe how successful it is um but why is it so successful what they did is they um designed a qualitative analysis consisting of interviews with um users and with platform designers they talked to some of the designers of the platform itself uh, and with the users of the platform as well to try to get a better sense of why this is so attractive and appealing to people um, and they have all kinds of uh, interesting findings about uh, about why that is but the point is the numbers by themselves 
only painted a very narrow picture of how popular, how successful this is. It was with this additional qualitative interviews that they were able to um, explain perhaps why, why they were observing those uh, abnormally uh, high uh, numbers. So that was one example. The last one, um, and you, you can read more about this uh, yourselves. This is an example of the concurrent triangulation strategy. So here, instead of doing things in sequence, both of the previous examples were sequential. Here, here you can see an example of a paper study that does this concurrently. So here they're combining um, a um, survey with in-depth interviews. And this data from the survey and the interviews had been collected at the same time concurrently. Uh, and then the analysis was done jointly on the two data sets. So you, this is an example. You can read about this. Um, I won't go over this now. You can read about this um, offline. Um, so, OK, so this is more or less it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here this section. Yeah, um, all of these materials, everything I've referenced, including the examples, are in the Google Drive folder. So you could you could read more about this um, offline if you if you'd like. Any thoughts or uh, questions about mixed methods? Have I convinced you that this is uh, useful in in many cases? Kyle says thumbs up. All right, well, thank, thanks Nadia for the presentation. Uh, thanks everyone. I have some reading assignments and some more presentations. I will send those out um, after class. Uh, but otherwise I'll see you next time. Oh. All right, thank you.